know to be able to survive call until you become a little bit more um, familiar with glaucoma. So <clears throat> we're going to try a little something where you guys, I want like the junior residents to lead like teaching to the senior residents and then the senior residents can kind of correct or like, you know, adjust things based on their knowledge, but we're going to try it. It's a little bit of an experiment. We'll see how it goes. So introduction to glaucoma. Um, just to review the, you know, the five vital signs of the eye that you're going to want to make sure you're checking on every patient every time on call. All of these will relate to glaucoma, acuity, fields, pupillary exam, motility maybe not so much, and then intraocular pressure. So intraocular pressure is obviously the most important thing that you're checking in when you're worried about glaucoma, especially acutely for your call issues. Um, a lot of people will often ask, your, you know, your patients will ask, well, how will I know if the pressure's high? Um, and the answer is, you know, almost always they won't know. And then people want to know, well, why when the pressure goes up, um, like in acute angle closure, do they have pain, but then the pressure can be 50 and patients have no idea. And the analogy I always use to describe it is the frog in the boiling water, which you guys have probably all heard of, which is you can put a frog in water and then you slowly turn up the heat and the frog doesn't notice and then it boils to death because it's like, oh, you know, it doesn't really notice that the water is getting warmer and warmer and warmer as it does so very, very slowly. But if you drop a frog in boiling water, it hops out because, you know, it suddenly recognizes the change from normal to markedly abnormal. The eye is the same way. So when the pressure goes up, very rapidly over a short period of time from a low number to a high number. Even if it's like six to 30, but it goes up really quickly, that patient might be super symptomatic um, versus if it goes up really slowly and it's maybe 60, but it's been, you know, it went up slowly and it's been 60 for weeks, you might have no symptoms at all. And then the reason why pressure is important, one, because it usually gives you an idea of what's going on, and two, it's the only means we have for treating glaucoma. Even though there's a lot more going on in glaucoma than we fully understand, all we have is pressure. And so that's why we always care so much about what's the, what is the pressure, what is the pressure. And then always important to know, you don't have to have high pressure to have glaucoma. And I saw a patient today, or not today, but this week, um, who, her normal tension glaucoma was missed multiple times by us, and she now just has a central island in one eye um, because her pressures have always been normal. She complained about progressively worsening vision. Her worsening RAPD was missed, and then we did fields, and she's got, she has some, like no vision left. So um, just keep that in the back of your mind when people complain about vague visual complaints. Make sure you're carefully checking for an RAPD, and then think, you know, could this be? glaucoma, normal pressure glaucoma. Visual fields, um, you know, in an acute setting in the emergency room, they're a little bit harder to do, but they'll give you an idea whether or not they're, you know, intact or severely restricted. So it's still a good idea in your acute patients, your call patients, to be doing visual fields, um, confrontational visual fields. In clinic, um, you know, we'll go over visual fields in a lot more detail in a separate lecture, but almost always glaucoma starts with kind of those peripheral defects, the classic nasal step, and then it progresses to the arcuate defects. Um, normal tension, you can get the paracentral scotoma, and then, then you'll get the superior arcuate and the inferior arcuate, and that will leave you with your central island, and then you'll have blackout vision. Um, but that's essentially the wide range of glaucoma visual fields. And then my favorite little meme, I'll give you guys a chance to read that. And then, you know, obviously you're checking visual acuity on all these patients. Visual acuity in glaucoma is deceptive, right? You, you all, well, anyone who's been at the VA has had this patient where you look at their field and it's just black. And then you look at their vision and they're 20 20. And you think, how on earth is this possible? And it's because that one, you know, tiny little intact portion of their nerve fiber layer is in their central macula is still sending signals and they can still see, but literally everything else is gone. And this works against us because <coughs> patients don't notice their vision loss until the very, very end because your brain is essentially filling in those gaps. 
So your brain, again, when patients ask, well, how come I didn't notice that I was losing vision until it was really, really late? It's because your brain is acting essentially like Photoshop. It's why none of us notice our blind spots. Even, you know, one eye closed, other eye closed, you still don't notice your blind spot until something is moving and then you can actively see where it disappears into your blind spot. But otherwise, your brain is taking context clues from what it thinks should be there and putting it there. And it does that in glaucoma too. So oftentimes patients see the Humphrey visual field printout with the blackout areas and think that's what they should be seeing, but it's not. They just kind of see what their brain is filling in. And so that's why nobody notices their vision loss until it gets really bad. Or they'll tell you, you know, things just keep coming. Like on the side, I won't notice them. And then all of a sudden there's a car there. Or all of a sudden people are sneaking up on me on the side. They're not gonna tell you, oh, I have a visual field defect. They're gonna tell you people are sneaking up or I'm having trouble, you know, I can't read it's because their visual field down there is gone. But they're not gonna say, well, I have blackout vision and an arcuate defect down here. And then pupillary exam is really, like I said, really important in glaucoma. That patient that lost 90% of her vision, if we would have just caught, she's been seen here at Moran for the last three years. For the last two years, they've been complaining of vision loss in her left eye. And no one caught this RAPD. It's like a four plus RAPD now. And so it was, it's clearly been there for a while. Um, so make sure in the clinic, you know, oftentimes the techs are checking pupils for you. I love our techs, but they will miss an RAPD, even a glaring RAPD, half the time. So make sure, especially when you're, when you're worried about glaucoma or you're worried about the optic nerve, double check pupils. Look for an RAPD yourself. Don't rely on somebody else to do it. Um, or you can screen for pupillary things by asking them, you know, does one eye seem brighter than the other? Do colors seem different, one eye versus the other? So even if you walk in and they're dilated, you can still, like, red DSAT them. If you think, oh, gosh, maybe, maybe I can't trust this pupillary exam. They're already dilated. Well, I can still do a red DSAT or ask them brightness testing. So don't forget to think about the, you know, the pupillary exam. And then um, glaucoma, you know, Oftentimes in glaucoma, if it's even a little bit asymmetric, you'll still get an APD. It might be subtle, um, but a, like a, a decent-sized nasal step is enough to produce, in one eye and not the other, is enough to produce an APD. So just keep that in mind. All right. Um, glaucoma, you guys know, it's not a problem with the faucet. It's almost always a problem with the drain. That's just the basic anatomy. And then... Gonio is the other major part of the exam that's not a visual sign of the eye, but that you should be doing on any patient. Basically, I say any new patient that you see you should get a gonio. One, because you might see something that helps tell you what's going on with that patient. And two, because the only way you're ever going to get good at doing gonio is if you do gonio. So the more you do it, the better it's going to get. Certainly, any new glaucoma patient to any clinic needs a gonio. Um, Dr. Orozco will tell you at the VA, if you're thinking about dilating a 90-year-old guy who's still got his lens in, you don't do that until you gonio him and make sure that his angles are open. Um, Post-trauma patients looking for angle recession or PAS, diabetic patients, uveitic patients looking for PAS. So there really are a lot of patients where, um, even if you're not thinking glaucoma, the angle can tell you a lot about what's going on. And then the mnemonic for those of you who are first starting out looking at the angle and thinking, what the heck am I looking at? It's, I can't see this stuff, which is iris, ciliary body, scleral spur, trabecular meshwork, and then Schwabi's line. Rating the angle, there's kind of an art to this, but you know, when you're looking at the angle, you're trying to assess a number of different things. When you're first starting out, you're basically just wanting to say, what, what am I looking at? What are these structures? Is it open or closed? As you get a little bit better um, at doing it, you're trying to say, okay, where, what are these structures exactly that I'm looking at? Where is the iris inserting? Anterior to Schwabi's line is grade A, between Schwabi's line and scleral spur is B. Scleral spur, scleral spur visible is C, and then if you can see the ciliary body, D or E. And then the angle of insertion, 
So what angle is it open? You know, is it 30 degrees, usually pretty narrow, 45 degrees, pretty open? So you're just kind of getting as much information as possible. And really, the, you know, this is just a guess. You're looking at it and saying, I don't know, it looks narrow, 35 degrees. 30 degrees sounds good. And then the iris configuration. Um, most patients, if they're normal, will have just a flat iris. The bowed anteriorly is frequently what you'll see when you're worried about narrow angle or pupillary block. Plateau iris is pretty uncommon and hard to see, but that's where you get that hump of tissue right at the angle. It's almost like the, the classic board finding is the double hump sign, um, but you get this extra kind of mound of iris tissue right near the angle. And then the concave, that, does anyone know what kind of glaucoma you frequently see a concave iris configuration in? Yes. But classically, I think you're young, myopic males. Yeah. So the classic glaucoma that you'll see, the concave, is your pigmentary glaucoma. You've got the young, myopic patients, the eyes stretched really long, the iris actually bows a little bit um, posteriorly, and it's that posterior bowing that allows it to rub <coughs> the sheath on the lens, and that's how you get the pigment dispersion. So if you're ever on a test and somebody says something about the gonio is bowed posteriorly, they're almost always trying to tell you this patient has pigment dispersion. And then just some gonio examples. Um, the only way you'll get good at figuring out what you're looking at is by, one, doing it and also looking at examples. So the one at the top is just kind of a nice, normal, open angle. You can see ciliary body. You can see a pretty densely pigmented trabecular meshwork and maybe like a faint Sampolisi line on that one. Who can tell me what a Sampolisi line is? I know you guys all can. It's like when you get a little bit more pigmentation uh, of the, um, like pigment dispersion from our and it's like right above or right on Schwabe's line? Exactly. So there's technically, they, they think microscopically there's a little transition area where the endothelium is ending, which is what Schwalbe's line represents, and then the, um, the angle structures are starting. And so it's a natural place where pigment can kind of accumulate on this tiny little shelf. And so if you see anybody with a densely pigmented um, line right at Schwalbe's line, then you want to think pigment dispersion or pseudoexfoliation, post-trauma is another one, or uveitics can get it. People can get it post-cataract surgery, so sometimes you'll see some pigment, especially inferiorly if you're gonioing someone after cataract surgery. Anything where there's been a little bit of inflammation in the eye can allow pigment to build up on, on Schwabe's line. When is it, why is it important to know if you're looking at a Sampolisi line or the trabecular meshwork? SLT them? <laughs> you SLT them, exactly. You don't want to SLT their endothelium. That would be sub-ideal. Um, and also, oftentimes, in like say <coughs> this patient here, when you get really good at gonioing, you'll discover the corneal light wedge reflex, which <coughs> basically tells you in a normal cor in normal cornea you have the anterior wedge of or the anterior kind of strip of your slit beam which is on the um, epithelium and then your internal wedge of slit beam which is on the endothelium well when your endothelium ends these two strips join together so that's happening at Schwalbe's line but if you have a pigmented Schwalbe's line it can look like trabecular meshwork and so it can mean the difference between an angle like telling if an angle is open or closed. So if you see this pigment, you might think, oh, well, there's a trabecular meshwork. I can see the TM. Obviously, the angle's open. But if you do your corneal light wedge reflex, you realize, oh, nope, that's just a densely pigmented Schwabe line, and this angle is actually closed. So Iowa has a great resource. Um, it's like an atlas of every different gonio exam finding you would ever want to see and there are videos, so you can watch him literally sit there and just go near the angle and zoom in and show you exactly what you should be seeing when you're doing gonio correctly. Um, and it 
is it's pretty helpful. So if you have some free time instead of aging all your colleagues, <laughs> you can hang out on uh, goniacipi.org and watch amazing Gonia videos. And then the final part of you know, of any eye exam, especially when you're thinking about glaucoma, is evaluating the optic nerve and, you know, assessing the cuptic disc ratio. And this is just, you know, obviously a really elementary review, but you're assessing the health, healthy room of tissue relative to the, the cupping um, centrally and kind of it's a gestalt, like how much, you know, what percentage of this optic nerve is taken up by cupping versus how much healthy rim there is. Things you'll want to take into account when you're looking at a nerve like this and saying, well, is this a normal nerve that just kind of has a, a physiologic larger cup? You know, looking at the rim tissue, as you get better at looking at glaucoma, you can also look at kind of the NFL um, nerve fiber layer as it's emanating off of the nerve and you can start to see little focal wedges or defects that could indicate glaucoma versus just physiologic and then obviously this is where um, RNFL OCT is handy where you get an RNFL OCT on this patient and it's all green and 120 well this is physiologic versus you know if this is all they have superior thinning inferior thinning then this is glaucoma so it's not always easy to tell um, and a nerve that looks like this, if this is true glaucoma or not. So, all right, getting into cases. Case number one. 76 year old female, red, painful eye, past 24 hours. What do you want to know? Blood signs. Red, like what? Vision pupils, pressure. <laughs> okay, what else do you want to ask? <clears throat> Ever had this before? Good question. Never had surgery on her. No previous ocular surgery. Never had anything like this before. Um, what was she doing when it happened? Uh, she was uh, laying down getting massage. <laughs> <laughs> was it dark? <laughs> she was prone. I actually did have a patient who owned a massage studio and said, oh, I can't get massages anymore because anytime I lay down to get a massage, I get a horrible, horrible headache that just lasts like all night. So the provocative testing in glaucoma does sometimes work. So never had anything like this before. No past ocular history. She wears glasses. Um, she had a mom with glaucoma. Her past medical history, unremarkable. Um, what's on your differential? You know, this lady in the ER, she's kind of got a red, angry eye, maybe a little corneal edema. If this weren't a glaucoma lecture, what else would you be thinking? Scleritis. Scleritis is good. Conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis. Uveitis. Uveitis is good. Those are all. She had just had surgery, endophthalmitis, inflammation, scleritis, uveitis, and then obviously glaucoma. So here's her exam. So pertinent findings here, she's hyperopic, <coughs> her pupil is mid-dilated and not reactive, her pressure is 56. And then pertinent findings here, <coughs> hazy cornea, fixed iris, uh, narrow anterior chamber, she's a little bit too hazy and won't let you go neo her right away. So you're just looking by pen light, which you can do in the, in the ER if you have to. And then, you know, hard to get a view beyond her cornea because it's so hazy, but there's like a, you know, maybe a cataract there. Um, and then you're, you think, you finally talk her into letting you do a gonio, and she's A. You can't see any trabecular meshwork. It's all just, you know, there's nothing to see in there um, with a bowed angle, and then you gonio her other eye, and it's really narrow. So, what is this? Okay, so now I want you just kind of get in maybe like little groups and talk about who's at risk for ingle closure and what the pathophysiology is of pupillary block. That's really like the important thing to understand with acute ingle closure crisis. So, get together. Yeah. And I want you the, the PGY2s to try and lead as much as possible. Yeah. And then the yeah. PGY3s and 4s. I haven't had to do it myself. So, 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 so
if that corneal edema is not there anymore and the pressure is super high and the angle is closed, then they've been in angle closure a while. Um, but yeah, those are the big ones. Good job. What about risk factors? Um, Go, you can have like a short eye. Short eye. Um, increasing age. Increasing age. Female. Female. Asian or like Pacific Islander descent. Perfect. Um, genetic like family history. Yes. Um, use of like anticholinergics or like topamax or something. Excellent. Good job. Um, <laughs> okay, we'll talk about pathophysiology in a second and then the difference anatomically between what the angle configuration is and specifically what pupillary block is in just a second. So we talked about signs and symptoms, shallow anterior chamber, risk factors, crowded anterior chamber, so your short axial length and hyperopia, um, also a, a, like a, a smaller cornea um, and a flatter corneal diameter can also, corneal diameter can also put you more at risk, and then age, um, and a lot of that just has to do with changes in the cataract. So even if they don't have phacomorphic glaucoma, just age-related changes to the lens tend to shift everything forward. And so that's why it's rare to see acute pupillary block angle closure in young patients unless something else weird is going on. And then one of the things they think can also predict angle closure is the ability of the iris to retain water, and so some people will measure like your how boggy or, or mushy your iris is um, with anterior segment OCT. That's kind of a newer field, um, but there's a lot of research into that, so that might start to be questions like on on OCAPs. And then genetics, Asians and Inuits, and first degree relatives. So the pathophysiology of an acute primary angle closure is pupillary block, meaning something is obstructing the flow of fluid at the pupil. The pupil is blocked. When that happens, fluid can't get out from behind your iris, and that's what causes everything to push forward. So it's, it's an anatomical setup that puts you at risk, but the actual instigating thing is something happening at the pupillary margin lens interface that stops the flow of fluid around the lens, and that pushes everything forward, and only once everything is pushed forward does the angle completely close off. Does that make sense? So that's when you get your classic, really narrow in the periphery, but relatively deep or formed centrally, the kind of Bombay appearance, because you're having the accumulation of fluid behind the iris. And that is why a PI is helpful in pupillary block glaucoma because you're relieving that pressure that's pushing everything forward. Drilling that hole doesn't change anything about their angle. Their angle is still narrow. It's just you relieved the acute pushing forward from the fluid. Does that make sense? Okay. So just to reiterate that, normal angle, angle's nice and open, there's plenty of room for fluid to flow out from behind your iris. Narrow angle, again, that area's a lot narrower, but fluid can still get from back to front without a problem. In pupillary block, the iris and the lens are kind of stuck together. And it happens in that mid-dilated position for some reason. That's where things tend to have a hard time. There's a lot more um, touch between the iris and the lens when the pupil's mid-dilated. And so that's why things like closing your eye or laying prone, those things that put you in mid-dilated or certain types of medications, anticholinergics, that kind of mid-dilate the pupil are the biggest risk factors for sending someone into acute angle closure. Did you draw those? I did not. Oh. I think Griffin drew them. <laughs> and then this is classically what you will see. So you can tell, right, there's something pushing that iris forward from behind. And this is the patient in that classic iris Bombay pupillary block appearing angle closure. Again, pupillary block, iris Bombay. This one has a more advanced cataract. So what's the treatment? Emergently, you're going to give them Diamox. Diamox, Diamox, Diamox. And then you're going to call the fellow or your chief, depending on how comfortable the chief is, and you're going to have them do a PI. And the reason why the PI works is because... Laser iridotomy is a type of laser... <laughs> sorry, sorry. Because you're just drilling...
a hole in the iris to let the fluid flow out. You're neutralizing the pressure gradient. That's the only reason why it works. You're not changing anything anatomically or structurally about the angle. You're just preventing that, that pressure buildup behind the iris. Oh, hello, Lisa. <laughs> 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 and then oftentimes, if you've gone into acute angle closure crisis, like you've truly gone into it, oftentimes we're going more towards early cataract surgery in these people, but not always. And you can see why, can someone explain actually why cataract surgery, why it's hard to have or almost impossible to have pupillary block angle closure in someone who is pseudophagic? Because the lens is Exactly. Exactly. You're exactly right. So you can just see the difference on this anterior segment OCT between pre-cataract surgery. The angle is open, but it's narrow, and you can just see that lens is taking up space versus post-cataract surgery. There's a whole lot more room in the eye, and there's not a lot of apposition between the iris and the IOL. The only time I've ever seen acute pupillary block and a patient without a lens was a patient who was aphagic and she grew a membrane entirely over her pupil. And then you just yag the membrane and give her back her pupil and problem is solved. But it's, all, it's practically impossible. If someone's pseudophagic and you think they have angle closure, it's probably almost definitely not a pupillary block. And that's something that took me, I think, as a resident full on halfway into my second year to really understand who needs an LPI and who doesn't. So case number two, we kind of talked about this. Everything's the same except for, oh, what's that right in the middle of her eye? I don't know, her optometrist told her she had a cataract a while ago, but cataract surgery scared her. And uh, pressure's high, she can't see anything out of that eye, and she's got a white lens. So what is the difference between someone who gets pupillary block angle closure and someone who goes into phacomorphic angle closure. Discuss. You have a minute. Sorry, explain. Uh, uh, yeah. just is the primary mechanism pupillary block or is there something else going on? Uh, yeah, I don't really understand what you're asking. Um, so she's asking for the So I guess the first question is what's phacomorphic? But that's like a fake homomorphic block oh, like yeah. cause, or you can't cause like pupillary yeah. block. That's the question. Yeah. That's the question. Yeah. So you got the hard part. You got the hard part. Let's go. Let's go. So So like an example of someone with a fake cataract who goes into from dilation. Is this both categories? Is this so it's emergent cataract surgery. That's like, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that's what happened. Yeah, so my understanding was that it's not the abominant results and then, like, the next day. Yeah, like, that's, yeah, that's kind of like. As soon as their cornea is clear enough. Yeah, like, because their cornea is not easy, right? Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, so that'll, that's like the one, like, emergent cataract surgery. Yeah, that could cause a little So, okay. So this, this was like the gift that Dr. Zabriskie gave me when I was like just finishing fellowship. He's like, congratulations, you're towards the end of your fellowship. This, it will be your first case. I'll be, your, I'll be down the hall if you need me, but we'll add this on in room four. So it, this, gets at a, this gets a lot of things, which is, first of all, the difference between primary pupillary block angle closure and phacomorphic angle closure is the mechanism, right? It's purely, purely the lens that's pushing everything forward in phacomorphic. They do not have to be predisposed to angle closure to go into phacomorphic angle closure. They can have the widest open angle in the other eye that you have ever seen, and that angle can be completely closed in the eye with the bad cataract, simply because that lens is taking up so much space, it's just completely pushed everything forward and closed things off. So it's a different mechanism. It is not a primary pupillary block. There may be a slight component of pupillary block that develops, and so oftentimes, 
people will try an LPI in these patients to relieve whatever pupillary block component there is, but it is not curative. You'll find the pressure will still be high in these people. And this is, as Brad was saying, kind of the only scenario where cataract surgery is an emergency. The cure, the only way we're gonna get pressure down in this patient is by taking their cataract out. We can temporize them with Diamox, try and bring the pressure down. We could, you know, do an AC tap if there's room, but you gotta get the pressure down and then you have to get the cataract out. So yeah, this was a lovely lady who presented, of course, on Friday afternoon at like 3.45, spoke no English. Um, she came to us already, well, I tried to put a PI on her and her pressure's still 65. Um, so we admitted her, she got IV Diamox over the weekend and then took this cataract out on Monday. It was super fun um, with no angle. You'll often find when you're doing cataract surgery on these patients, there's a component of zonular loss too that's allowed everything to shift forward, right? So the zonules get loose when the cataract is that big, they get stretched and then everything just pushes forward. And stuff. You're cheaper like that. <laughs> right? <laughs> you, so there's a lot, you can give them like preoperative Diamox or preoperative mannitol to try and shrink, um, shrink the vitreous. There's a thing called a Honin balloon, which you will read about. I've never seen it used, but the idea is it, it pushes it down. essentially pushes it down to give you more of an anterior chamber. Or you can call your friends in retina and have them come in and do a little preparatory vitrectomy to give yourself some more room. Or you can do it yourself mid-case if you feel like. Um, Dr. Chai has done it, had to do it a couple times where there's just no room to work and so you go in, you do a little vitrectomy, things have more room to fall back and then you have a chamber again. Um, but yeah, it's not fun. It requires a lot of viscoelastic and, uh, and, and yeah, you lose a year of your life when you do it. Um, so essentially the big, biggest difference is the mechanism. A PI is not going to be curative in these people, whereas in primary angle closure it can be, um, and then the cataract. And so again, I think a lot of you have seen this, but my cat went into phacomorphic angle closure glaucoma while I was at Ascaris. Um, so I came home and his cornea looked like this, and then he had to get enucleated. And now he's a, a one-eyed cat, but he's very happy. <laughs> Not was in pain he, was anymore. He in, like, did he show signs of pain? Oh yeah, he was he was really uncomfortable. And he had underlying uveitis, so that probably was a component of it, but I could tell a cataract was developing <laughs> quite a while. It seemed like in um phacomorphic or uh pupillary block the angle could be open. Is it true? Like the lens in either case can be completely blocking. Well, the angle, in acute phacomorphic, the angle would still be closed just because the lens has pushed everything as part, of as part of it. But if you're looking, oftentimes, like, if you're trying to tell the difference between, oh, is, is this primary angle closure, is there a phacomorphic component, you can look at the other eye. And if the other eye is open, then whatever's going on in that eye is probably just a phacomorphic. Um, oftentimes, you know, Really, the biggest differentiation is, is important for testing purposes because they'll ask you, is this phacomorphic or is this primary angle closure? In the real world, it's usually a little bit of both, which is why in the real world, most of these patients end up getting PIs anyways because there's probably some component of a pupillary block going on in addition to the phacomorphic component. Okay, so in your group's 26-year-old female with bilateral eye pain, redness, blurry vision, what do you want to know for her? given that this is a glaucoma lecture. She's 26. It's bilateral. <laughs> so anytime you see a question like this uh, set up on a, you know, they're trying to get you to think about what? Medical history. Yeah. They're trying to get you to think about Topamax. So, oh, any recent history of migraines, any medication changes, what are you on? Oh, epilepsy. Oh, what medication have you just started? And then the key for a Topamax induced angle closure is it's bilateral. So if both eyes are in acute angle closure and they're young, it's a medication induced until, until proven otherwise. And on a test, it's almost always Topamax. Um, do you give these people a PI, an LPI? Do they? No. Why not? Yes. Why wouldn't it help? 
There's no pupillary block. That's right. So can anyone tell me what the proposed mechanism is for why Topamax can cause acute ankle closure? Anterior rotation of the ciliary body. Exactly. Good job. So anterior rotation of the ciliary body, you can get ciliary body effusions, rotates everything forward, pushes everything forward. Um, bilateral is bilateral angle closure. It's almost impossible for people to present bilateral acute angle closure. Um, it does happen, but almost always if they're presenting bilaterally, it's topamax. And then the treatment is to stop the drugs and lower the IOP in the interim. It will resolve once you stop the topamax. It will go away. Those effusions will resolve. The ciliary body will rotate back to where it should be. And you just have to keep the pressure stable while you do it. There's no role for an LPI in these patients. So just a few other types of angle closure, glaucoma that you'll frequently see on call. Neovascular glaucoma, I mean, in, in testing situations, it's usually fairly obvious they're trying to point you towards angle closure. You'll see florid iris neovascularization. They'll have a history of poorly controlled diabetes or a CRVO, BRVO. Anything that causes ischemic changes in the eye can give you neovascular glaucoma. <coughs> in reality, it's often really difficult to see these vessels, especially if the cornea is hazy um, or the iris is dark. So you have to really, really have a high threshold of suspicion in these patients to look for vessels. Do these patients need a PI? Why not? The are right. So the mechanism in this is not, again, it's not a pupillary block glaucoma. You have vessels growing into the angle that are causing anatomic closure of the angle, but there is nothing pushing from behind that is causing the angle to close. So again, this is something that I would see as a fellow, the residents would call me and say, oh, hey, I think this patient needs a PI, and it ends up being neovascular glaucoma. These patients, not that you, you can PI them, and then they'll just bleed everywhere. Not ideal. So these patients almost always end up needing um, glaucoma surgery, usually a tube, um, depending on their vision and their visual prognosis. And then malignant glaucoma. So malignant glaucoma is pretty uncommon, but I saw it maybe three times as a fellow, um, almost always at night when everyone else is, I think the worst case was with Tina, everyone was gone at AAO. Um, patient with a pressure of 70. And the key hallmark in malignant glaucoma is a uniformly flat chamber. So if you see that Bombay appearance, it's not malignant glaucoma. But if everything is just diffusely pushed forward, and oh, I don't know, they had glaucoma surgery or cataract surgery earlier that day or the day before, it's, it's malignant glaucoma. Um, the key that you'll see on a test is they'll say, oh, this patient super narrow, angle closure, you do a PI, and nothing changes. There's no, you know, there's no improvement in their symptoms. There's no improvement in pressure. The angle is still completely closed off. So no improvement after PI is the hallmark with molecular glaucoma. Here's an example of what it looks like. You can tell everything, you can see how it's different than that Bombay appearance. Everything is pushed forward. And then again, an anterior segment OCT showing just diffuse anterior pushing of the vitreous. Who can explain the mechanism or the proposed mechanism for malignant glaucoma? What do they think is happening? Why are things getting pushed forward? Oh, yes. Yeah. It's the, uh, it's, 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 right. it's like the vitreous is basically, like, I don't, it, isn't it like unknown, kind of? <laughs> <laughs> that won't stop it. it that's true. It it's is like, true. As I was saying, and I was like, wait, no, they, I feel like every explanation <laughs> I've read is like. The, the classic explanation is you have, you, instead of the aqueous getting secreted into the, into the posterior chamber, posterior chamber being in between the iris and the lens, it's actually getting uh, secreted into the vitreous, and it goes posterior to the vitreous, builds up behind the posterior hyaloid, pushes the vitreous forward. So it's actually anterior pressure from the vitreous being displaced anteriorly is the classic teaching. Whether or not that is actually true remains to be seen. But that is why one of the treatments is to YAG the hyaloid, because you're trying to disrupt the vitreous enough to allow that 
fluid from behind to come forward. So treatment for malignant glaucoma. Acutely, you're trying to lower the pressure as best you can with drops. They almost always need IV Dimox. They'll end up getting an LPI just because you kind of have to do it to prove to yourself that it's malignant glaucoma. So you do your PI and nothing happens. You start them on atropine. 50% of the time over time, atropine will, will allow this to resolve, but it usually takes a long time for the atropine to kick in. So in the meantime, you can try to yag the anterior hyaloid face to try and disrupt that face so the fluid can come forward and relieve that pressure. I've never seen it work. I've tried it. I yagged the crap out of this lady's vitreous and just nothing. And then I called Zabriskie and he said, oh yeah, I've never seen it work. But the one time someone's told me that it worked is when you actually yag through the PI. So then I tried that and I just yagged the crap out of her vitreous through the PI and still nothing happened. And she eventually went on to have surgery. So 50% of the time, in theory, atropine can, these can resolve with atropine. I think in reality, most of these patients go on to just get a vitrectomy with the zonulo hyaloidoid iridectomy, meaning you're actually taking part of the zonules as well. Does this happen exclusively in, in post <laughs> Operative Almost patients. always it's post-operative. There are like case reports of spontaneous malignant glaucoma, yeah. um, and those are kind of controversial. So almost always it's a post-operative patient. Frequently it's post-leg glaucoma surgery, but it can be, or complex anterior segment, like with the one that I saw on call was like an iris sutured, secondary IOL, iris sutured IOL. And then that patient went into malignant glaucoma afterwards. So uh, this weekend we, we had a patient who like came in um, super high pressure and the like, lens was like basically against the cornea and it turned out they had like hemorrhagic choroidals um, on these scan. Does that count as malignant glaucoma? No. Then, okay, no. So you bring up a good point, which is make sure you're looking in the back of the eye. So you can do all that stuff and have the exact same exam findings with hemorrhagic choroidals being the mechanism that's pushing everything forward as well. So you still are obligated to do your full eye exam or a B scan. Um, but yes, hemorrhagic choroidals can present very similarly to malignant glaucoma. I think they did everything. They did like an LPI and then they tried to yank the vitreous and then they were like, oh, this might be something else. So in an ideal world, look before. Yeah. <laughs> get a B scan before. Because yes, you're exactly right. Hemorrhagic choroidals will look just like that. Is that No one knows, but yeah, they, I mean, that's the theory, is that you've somehow disrupted the normal flow of aqueous. Okay. And so surgery is obviously the primary mechanism. I guess you could make the argument maybe trauma could do it right. um, as well. I haven't seen it. Okay, so that's kind of acute issues with angle closure on call. You'll get less commonly on call, you'll get, you'll get these problems, which are the open angle problems. So our 57-year-old African-American male with vision changes in the right eye, He's probably not going to present to the emergency room, but he might. In fact, my very first patient on call my PGY2 year was exactly this case. It wasn't Barack Obama, though. Barack Obama have Obama? No. <laughs> um, so things you want to know, you know, vision changes. Yeah, vision maybe. They're going to have vague complaints. They're not going to be specific. Angle closure, those complaints are specific. Open angle glaucoma, those complaints are vague. Um, I don't know, my mom had cataracts or glaucoma or something. People will always tell you like the few ocular diagnoses they've heard of. Um, his past medical history, he has a high stress job, or at least he had a high stress job. And then this, you know, really kind of a normal benign appearing exam until you check pressure and it's elevated in the right eye. And his optic nerve looks like this. So cases where these kind of patients will present, you know, this is where one gonio is going to help you. You're going to gonio him. His angle is super deep. You know he's not in angle closure, but the pressure's high. He's got cupping. You're thinking, why is this guy presenting to the emergency room? This is clearly open angle glaucoma. What often happens in these patients when they present acutely is the acute recognition of a chronic problem. They, for some reason, close their other eye, and they realize, oh, man wait a second, I can't see out of this eye nearly as well as I can out of the other, and then they come to the emergency room. So that is what happened with my lady. 
um, who had a central island and then um, unfortunately for her she'd been following with an optometrist for like 20 years and had missed her glaucoma for years and years and years. She ended up needing a drug. Um, so Barack Obama says, good job, you diagnosed me. Strong work, everyone. What's this? Oh, a beer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I took that, I gave that talk to the, the PA students, and then I was like, I don't know, it's Utah. It's alcohol, I don't want to get in trouble. So I like, blocked out his <laughs> So these patients, you know, what are you gonna do? you're going to start them on drops. And your options are you can decrease the aqueous production or you can improve aqueous outflow. We'll go over drops again in a separate lecture, but you guys know the main categories. You have your beta blockers, your carbonic anhydrase, your alpha agonists, your uveoscleral, and then the newest one is the ROC or ROC kinase inhibitors, which is Repressa and Roclitan. Um, and basically we just throw anybody that we're desperate on. We, we're like, well, we can try Repressa. That's, that's approved in America? Yeah. At the VA? At the VA, everyone gets it now. It's, and we're, it's repressive. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, oh, last night, I had to get it from, like, uh, Japan. Is that when you decided you were going to be a global that for me. <laughs> it was part of it. It made me, actually, that's when I decided I was going to do advocacy. Because this lady had been just grossly mismanaged for years and years and years by an optometrist who was, like, masquerading as a, who told her that he was an eye doctor and um, essentially just let her go blind. So that, that's when I got involved with advocacy. You guys should all do. Everyone should go to Mid-Year Forum if you get the chance. It's the greatest conference, especially as a resident. Anyway, digression. Okay, the question always comes up, is this normal tension glaucoma or is this POAG? And the, you know, I just threw this in here more because you're going to be tested on this eventually, but the biggest difference is pressure, right? So in normal tension glaucoma, the pressure is normal. In, um, in POAG, the pressure is elevated. Cupping, you can make the argument that the cupping characteristics are a little bit different. They tend to have more sloped um, cupping in normal tension or more focal notching in normal tension. They think disc hemes are more common in normal tension. I think that that's probably just because their pressures are normal, but they're still unhealthy. And so most people have, you know, you're hanging out at these pressures that for most people are fine, but for them are unhealthy. and so. They're going to get disc hemorrhages where, for the POAG patients, they'll get, still get a disc hemorrhage if their pressure is at an unhealthy level, but for them it might be 40, and we're usually pretty good at treating those. So I think that might be why you see disc hemorrhages more frequently in normal tension, not because it's inherent to the pathophysiology. And then the thing to really know with normal tension is the systemic associations. So when you see normal tension glaucoma, especially if they're getting worse and their pressures are 10, you're going to want to screen. Do you have a history of migraine headaches? Do you have a history of Raynaud's phenomenon? Patients with that kind of vasospasm history are more at risk for normal tension. And then hypotension, especially nocturnal hypotension, so these patients will get blood pressure monitoring, they'll get sleep apnea workup, anemia can cause it as well. So these patients get systemic workups, especially when you're first diagnosing normal tension glaucoma, to make sure there's nothing else going on that's contributing to the nerve cupping. And it's essentially an ischemic idea, right? They're not carrying enough oxygen in their blood because of one of these conditions, or vasospasm is reducing the flow of blood to the optic nerve, and they get long-term chronic ischemic damage to the nerve from one of these mechanisms rather than it being pressure that's causing the ischemic damage. Does that make sense? or is that just like we're treating them because they might have sleep apnea? But we're treating their sleep apnea for the sake of sleep apnea. We're treating their, no, it can, it can stop. Like if you have a normal tension patient that's progressing and they have untreated sleep apnea, treating their sleep apnea will stop their progression or at least slow it frequently because you're increasing their oxygen carrying capacity at night. You know, they're often probably profoundly hypoxic at night. Their optic nerve is getting, your optic nerve is a watershed area just like your brain, like those watershed areas in the brain. And so if you're not carrying enough oxygen, by the time the blood gets to the internal parts of your optic nerve, then it doesn't have enough oxygen to really saturate the tissues the way that it normally would. So yes, if you're improving your oxygenation with the CPAP machine at night, you're gonna improve your glaucoma. <clears throat> so just a few other types of open angle glaucoma because we're here like in Salt Lake then, City. Oh, sorry. Like giving them oxygen also help them? Or giving them like nocturnal oxygen? Yeah. I mean, oh, okay. so, and some people with CPAPs, I think, do get some okay. supplemental oxygen as well. 
you're, inclu you're, no, you're doing the positive pressure ventilation, so they're oxygenating better on their own because they're keeping their alveoli open more, but you're also providing some supplemental oxygen a lot of the time too. Same reason why like profound anemia would cause the same problem because their oxygen carrying capacity is significantly reduced. So just a few other types to review, your open angle glaucomas, Scandinavian patient in Utah, and you see this on the lens, what is it? Pseudoexfoliation, and then you gonio them because you gonio everybody, and you see a sample EC line and a fairly pigmented trabecular meshwork. And you send them to the cardiologist, the GI specialist, if it's around the skin. They don't do any of that, probably. <laughs> so the thing to know with pseudoex is that it's a systemic disease. They just end up getting most of their effects in the eye. Um, I don't send them to cardiology. <laughs> It's most common in people of Scandinavian descent, and for some reason, people who've decided to settle in Salt Lake City <laughs> as well. And then you get the fibrillary material on the lens capsule and the iris, trabecular meshwork. It often presents with markedly elevated IOP, and they may have been people who've been stable for years. Like, oh yeah, they have pseudoexfoliation, but no signs of glaucoma. We'll follow them every, you know, some people will make the mistake of following them once a year. But that pressure can go up really quickly, very, very fast, over just a very short amount of time to really high numbers. Um, so the, and then they come to you a year later and their pressure is 60 and they're blind. So pseudoex needs to be followed, pseudoex without glaucoma needs to be followed at least twice a year that you're seeing them. Never let them go longer than that because they can just deteriorate really, really rapidly. And then cataract surgery, what do you worry about when you do cataract surgery on these people? You worry about their zonules. And then you also worry, they can go into ankle closure. Not necessarily during cataract surgery, but if those zonules are loose, everything can get pushed forward really easily. So these patients can go into acute ankle closure. And then treatment drops, SLT is usually pretty effective on them. Um, Angle-based surgery is usually pretty effective because the problem's right there in the trabecular meshwork. Um, but oftentimes, they'll go on to need a trab or a tube anyways. And then last one, I think, your young myopic male, we kind of already talked about this. Oh, my, my eye, I get this brow ache every time I go running, and then my vision's a little bit blurry. And they have, what is this? What's the official word for what this is showing? Rickenberg spindle. And they have iris TIDs. Does anyone know what this is called? Technically, there's two words for it. It could be a Zentmeyer line, or it could be a shy stripe but it's pigment from that chafing of the iris on the lens capsule. So if you dilate them and you see this kind of band of pigment, again, that's all findings consistent with pigment dispersion. And it's usually young patients, usually highly myopic. They usually have that bowed iris, Krukenberg spindle, sample AC line, mid peripheral iris, TIDs. Vision loss can be profound. Again, I've had a couple of patients who've been followed for years and then present, and everyone missed the fact that they had pigment dispersion syndrome and then when they finally go into acute glaucoma from it, no one knows to be following them at more regular intervals and their pressures are 60 for a year and they go blind. So again, if you have a patient with pigment dispersion, they need to be followed more regularly. Pigment dispersion without glaucoma needs to be followed just like a pseudo-X patient. Congenital glaucoma, kind of a lecture for another day, but um, the classic triad, who wants to tell me? Epiphora. Epiphora. Blinking, blepharospasm, and, and photophobia. So any baby where they present like that, always think glaucoma. Any baby that has corneal clouding, think glaucoma. A new baby with tearing, think glaucoma. Um, buthalmos is classic, but it's not part of the classic triad, so they don't necessarily have to have buthalmos. Oftentimes these patients will get treated for like a nasolacrimal duct obstruction, and people will miss that they have glaucoma. So a baby with tearing, it's not an, an NLDO until you've ruled out glaucoma. So just make sure you're checking the pressure and doing the glaucoma workup. And then babies can't get alpha agonists because it will depress their CNS and they'll stop breathing and then they'll die and you don't want to kill babies. And treatment is surgical. So drops are a temporary measure, but the treatment is to treat the angle with a goniotomy or a trabeculotomy. And then the last thing that you might encounter on call is troubleshooting your glaucoma post-ops. For MIGs, usually they're, they're troubleshooting their post-ops are kind of just your typical cataract patient troubleshooting when you're on call. 
Um, they might have a little bit more blurry vision because when you're working in the angle, it's more vascular, so they might have more cell. Um, they're at bigger risk for a hyphema, especially after a GAT. After a GAT, they're almost always going to have a hyphema. So if you get a call from a patient who's had an angle-based surgery, cataract surgery, a mixed procedure, um, you just want to make sure that the hyphema isn't, you know, an eight ball hyphema. It's okay for them to have a hyphema. You just treat it like a, treat it like you would treat any type of hyphema. Um, with a trab and a tube, the things you worry about are a lot more complicated, choroidal effusion, superchoroidal hemorrhage, overfiltration, leaking blood, underfiltration. And then the classic thing I got, you'll get asked this on every OCAPS. I got asked this twice on oral boards. They showed me like a picture of an anterior chamber and they said this patient is post-op day one after glaucoma surgery what is going on, and you have to ask, well, is their pressure high or low? What does their blub look like? So just know this flow sheet, it's, it's, it's a classic setup for a test question. So leaking blub, you would expect the IOP to be low. You would expect the chamber to be narrow, and you would expect the blub to be flat. It all just kind of follows with common sense. Overfiltration, IOP would also be low, but the blub would be elevated, right? Because you're getting all this flow of fluid out through your blub. Malignant glaucoma, the pressure is high and the chamber is flat. And then choroidal hemorrhage, you can really have, this is kind of what we we're talking about. Choroidal hemorrhage can present any way. It can present with low IOP because the low IOP is what puts them at risk for the hemorrhage. If that hemorrhage has been there for a while, it can push everything forward and cause the pressure to be acutely high. Usually the chamber will be shallow because everything's being pushed forward by these giant choroidal hemorrhages behind often see them when you look at the eye. They're kind of hanging out there saying hi to you from behind the pupil and then you feel terrible. And then the blub is variable. Um, but the way you'll know it's a choroidal hemorrhage is because they'll tell you, I sneezed and then all of a sudden my eye started to hurt like crazy or I bent over to pick up my newspaper and then all of a sudden I had severe pain and couldn't see anymore. That's it. Questions? With the, with the congenital glaucoma, um, do you, do you like to state them to check the pressure, or can you like feel their eye and like can tell that it's high? Um, I mean, if it's like a, if it's a baby, <coughs> you can usually <coughs> tone append them. Babies are more cooperative than like a two-year-old. Okay. Um, the, oftentimes, if you really think it's glaucoma, and they're older than a year or a year and a half, you have to do an EUA. You're not gonna get an accurate pressure because then they're screaming at you and they're valsalving and their pressure's gonna be high when they're screaming at you and you're trying to eye care them or tone append them and the eye care is telling you, you know, you're too far away, you're too close, you're too far. <laughs> so almost always, if you can catch them within the first year, you can usually get a pressure with a tone append. And then from about age one to age five, have to do it. You would have, if you were really suspicious, you know, say they were buphthalmic and um, had the classic triad, then you would just schedule them for an EUA. What other questions? Is this what people had in mind by an introduction to glaucoma lecture? Yeah, it's great. <laughs> it was like, it said to read chapter one, but chapter one is not actually an introduction to glaucoma. Those, those chapters are always wrong. <laughs> Addressing that, <laughs> the mole group is addressing these problems. The mole group. <laughs> What's the mole? Oh. The Moran yeah. Ophthalmology Learning. I love that acronym. Experience. Yeah. <laughs> 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 